In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we are celebrating the Feast of St. Thomas More. This saint's feast is not in the general calendar, unfortunately. It is a local feast to England and Wales. But nonetheless, it is his feast, nor is it the day that he died. He died on a, in December, but it is the day chosen to celebrate both St. Thomas More and St. John Fisher. You probably are somewhat familiar with the story. Henry VIII was a bestial being who, whose lust has become legendary. And for political reasons, which was common at the time, he wanted to marry Catherine of Aragon. But because there was a problem of consanguinity, that is, that she was too close to him by relation, there had to be a dispensation given by Rome in order to marry Catherine of Aragon. And this dispensation was given. Well, because of his, his unbridled lust, he took interest in a certain cheap thing known as Anne Boleyn, and wanted to put aside Catherine, who, by the way, was not bearing him any male heirs, and for the pretext that he needed male heirs, he uh, wanted to marry Anne Boleyn. So he applied to the same authority that gave him the uh, annulment, or rather the the dispensation to, to marry Catherine of Aragon, he applied to that same authority and said, I think that the dispensation should never have been given and in fact I'm in an invalid marriage to Catherine of Aragon and please declare all this to be true and give me now an annulment to my marriage to Catherine of Aragon uh, so I can marry Anne Boleyn. Now this was made to Clement VII who by his natural inclination, would have been someone to give in. He was a Medici Pope, and the Medicis were not known for piety. They were known for worldliness, they were known for ambition, but they were not known for piety. And he was a weak man. Uh, He does not go down in the history of the Church as one of its great popes. But nonetheless, to his great credit, He resisted, saying the original dispensation granted by the authority of the Pope was valid. Therefore, we cannot dispense you in this. Well, as you know, Henry went into a rage and decided to make himself the head of the church in England. And he required that everyone swear allegiance to him as head of the church in England. And most did over 95% did very few resisted a few Carthusian monks a few Franciscans one bishop and St. Thomas More now St. Thomas More was prominent because he was the Lord Chancellor of England he was also Henry's friend And so his resistance to Henry was particularly bitter to the king. And as a result, like the others, he was sentenced to death. Henry was so horrid that the three Carthusian monks who refused to sign, he hanged at Tyburn. Now hanging has always been considered the worst and most shameful form of death. The better way to go was to have your head chopped off. That was the dignified way. But if you were a lowly criminal, worthless, and to be despised, you were hanged. And he hanged three Carthusian monks at Tyburn. But St. Thomas More died the dignified way. He had his head chopped off. And today we celebrate his martyrdom. And there are four virtues that I would like you to consider in his martyrdom. The first is to act 
according to the dictates of supernatural virtue as opposed to natural virtue. Natural virtue wants you to make a good life here. It wants you to have the best. It wants you to be in good health, surrounded by friends and relatives, to have riches, to have everything this life can offer. Which is not bad in itself. It's a good thing, those things that I mentioned. But unfortunately, it is not enough for the human soul. Supernatural virtue, on the other hand, inclines you to heaven. Heaven, which is the pearl of great price. Heaven, which must be attained above all considerations. God, who must be loved above all things. Even above our own lives. And so supernatural virtue inclines us to set aside riches, to set aside health, even life, to set aside our friends and relatives, if necessary, in order to have the pearl of great price, the kingdom of God. And here we see in the martyr this wonderful virtue. All of his natural inclinations would have been to give in because he was a moderate man a person who did not want to make waves, a person loyal to his king, to his friend. Everything natural in him would have been to give in. But he acts according to the dictates of supernatural virtue and sets aside everything, his position, his friendship with the king, his natural obedience that he would give to the king, his family who was not with him on this. Everything. His reputation. Finally, his life. In order to obtain the prize, in order to obtain heaven. What a beautiful virtue that is and one that we must constantly remind ourselves of in these times where the world holds out to us always natural goals, natural virtues, the good life, lust, pleasure, riches, as if these were the only goals of men. The second virtue is the holy intransigence of a martyr. In order to be a martyr, you have to be intransigent. We marvel at the martyrs of the early times, the virgin martyrs, the, the, all of them. But they got to that wonderful place upon our altars, in our hearts, in our faith, only after a long process of holy intransigence. We don't read about the many thousands of others who fell down. The many thousands of early Catholics who sacrificed to the pagan gods who fell down. We read only about the holy intransigent ones ones who persevered until the end in this resolve and set aside threat and allurement given to them by the, their enemies in order that they cave in and they pursued their goal, they remained firm like a rock that is pounded by the waves, remaining always the same, giving always the same response, persevering right till the end in a holy intransigence. And this intransigence is good and holy 
And we must remind ourselves of that today because intransigence today is considered something that is the most evil thing that you could possibly be. If you dig in into your dogmas and your beliefs, then you are something that is to be despised. And why is that? It is because the liberals are intransigent it is because they have an agenda for the whole world. And if you don't go along with their concrete agenda, then you have to be socially put to death. They are intransigent. And if you don't accept their dictates, then there's something wrong with you. But we have to have the holy intransigence of martyrs if we are going to survive this age with the faith. The third virtue which we see in St. Thomas More is the defense of the holy sacrament of matrimony. Oh, how this is necessary today. Matrimony has become a shambles and those of you who are old enough to remember should recall that 50 years ago the term divorce was whispered as an evil word. It was a scandal that even Protestants or anybody should be divorced and remarried. It was an awful word Hey, more than half the people are divorced and remarried. Marriage has completely fallen apart. And since the 1970s, 50,000 annulments a year have been granted by the Novus Ordo. 50,000 a year. What does that make over 20 years? And as you know, for reasons that are utterly absurd, more absurd than the reason alleged by the bestial Henry VIII. More absurd than those, than this reason. It is Catholic divorce. A rose, by any other name, is a rose. And divorce, by any other name, is divorce. And the annulment process today is Catholic divorce. It is a way in which the Novus Ordo modernists are breaking down the Catholic intransigence on the sacrament of matrimony. And we have to take a stand concerning matrimony. In our families, among our friends you all have it if I were to talk to each one of you you could tell me about something in your family or among your friends divorce and remarriage phony families illegitimate phony families who do not issue from the true bond of matrimony the bond of matrimony which as St. Paul says, is the image of Christ's bond with His Holy Church. And which cannot be violated. And we as Catholics must take a stand and not be sucked into this flow, this tide of the breakdown of the sacrament of matrimony. In 10 or 20 years, matrimony will be something outmoded. People will merely live together, many of them, if not most of them. Why bother getting married when because of the selfishness of the present age it only nearly, well in most cases, ends up in misery and finally divorce, ends up in financial troubles, Stress, 
so why bother? This is the future of matrimony in this pagan world. And we must take a stand. And that means that in your families, you cannot say or do anything that would approve of a false marriage. And this at the high cost of losing the affection of your family members. The high cost, the daily martyrdom, the daily tears. So be it of losing the affection of your family and friends. There is a phenomenon that priests notice today and we call it child worship. Child worship. Where parents, because of naturalism and paganism essentially, place their children on a type of altar. And whatever the child desires, whatever the child does, whatever the child is inclined to, is wonderful. And the the older parents become sort of idolaters of their own children. So if the child decides to divorce and remarry, well, we must love our children and we accept the new spouse. If they get into so-called lifestyles, that are abominable. Well, we must love our children and then they become defenders of the new lifestyle and so forth. You know it all. I don't have to explain it to you. The filth of the modern age. But parents have a tendency to worship their children. And it is a form of bragging because their children are extensions of themselves and whatever the child does is wonderful because indirectly I am wonderful I could not have raised a child that would do a bad thing but we must love God above all things and the law of God must prevail and you should tell your children from an early age that if ever they should disobey in a serious way the law of God that the household and family is a household and family faith above all. Holy faith. Catholic faith. And that the affections and the ties of family or friends will not in any way become an obstacle to the dictates of holy faith. And if necessary, they will be ostracized from the family if they should violate the laws and the rights of Christ the King. The fourth virtue is the defense, and this is the most important, the defense of the traditional faith against the new religion. For St. Thomas More's defense of holy matrimony was merely a mean of defending something yet more basic, which was the Catholic faith itself. Henry VIII was claiming to be the head of the church in England, and this was against the faith. Since the Pope is the head of the whole church, it is for this reason that Henry's annulment which was granted to him by his lackey, schismatic bishops, had to be considered null in the mind of the Catholic since the validity of his first marriage had to be upheld because the Pope said no to his annulment. It was a question of faith for to recognize the new marriage would indicate that Henry truly was, in fact, the head of the church in England. And this was contrary to faith. And the head must be separated from the body in order to to attest to the truth of the Catholic faith. 
And this is the glory of St. Thomas. Similarly, our refusal to recognize the Novus Ordo annulments involves our refusal to recognize the Novus Ordo as the legitimate continuation of Catholicism. It is a false religion. It is an altered Catholicism. It is an altered Christ. And therefore, they do not have any more right to grant an annulment than your mailman. It is a question of faith. St. Thomas More tried to evade as much as he possibly could the questions of his persecutioners in the hope that they would leave him alone. And this is true of every martyr. The martyr does not provoke But he was nevertheless condemned to death, as you probably know, owing to the perjury, the lying under oath, of a certain Richard Rich. And when this happened, St. Thomas More gloriously opened his eloquent mouth to all of Parliament and said, the act of supremacy is an act directly repugnant to the laws of God and His Holy Church. For the supreme government of God's Holy Church, or of any part whereof, may no temporal prince presume by any law to take upon him. Such supreme government rightly belonging to the See of Rome And this spiritual preeminence being by the mouth of our Savior Himself personally present upon earth only to St. Peter and his successors, bishops of the same see, by special prerogative granted. And quoting the Athanasian Creed, he said, This is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe faithfully, he cannot be saved. And when he mounted the scaffold on December 28th of the year 1535, on the eve of the feast of St. Thomas a Becket, was slain a few hundred years earlier by the king's knights for his sane resistance to the usurpations of the king of England. St. Thomas More on this day addressed all the people gathered at Tyburn and said, Bear witness with him meaning St. Thomas, that he should now there suffer death in and for of the Holy Catholic Church. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.